Okay. Two little mechanical things here, and I think it's over here that I have to do that. Where are we? I will never figure all this out, I don't think. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I love it. I I uh, am going to entitle this. You know, I don't. I've never been a big title person, uh, as far as sermons are concerned, because uh, uh, it, uh, it it somewhat limits you once you've got this title, and all of a sudden you're preaching to the title rather than to the the scripture. But uh, this morning, related to the story of uh, Jesus's birth. Uh, I, I'm going to call this turning chaos into peace, okay? Uh, Luke chapter 2 says that Caesar Augustus sent a decree throughout all the lands that each person would need to be registered. It happened during the reign of Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria, and the registration would take place in the city where the head of each family was born. Joseph, being from the family of David, left Nazareth in Galilee and proceeded to Judea, to the town of Bethlehem, which was David's hometown. Mary, who was close to, her, close to full term in her pregnancy, made the journey as well so they could register in the census. During their visit, the baby was born. And they ended up spending their nights with the animals in a stable because all of the inns in town were full. During one of those nights, the time came for Mary to give birth and her son was born in the stable amongst the animals. The softest place for the baby Jesus was a tiny manger filled with hay. So his mother wrapped him in a blanket and laid him there to sleep. It's the little things, I think, that change chaos into peace. And, and I think the Christmas story gives us three of these simple things that are not always easy, but they're, they're simple concepts to grab a hold of. The secrets, if you will, that will help us remember to uh, be at peace in this time. One of them is faith. You can imagine that the next might be hope and the next might be love, but somewhat in that order. Um, Joseph and Mary were secure in the manger. I don't think it was because their ability to take care of themselves in the rough times of life or the rugged life that they lived was the answer to why they were secure. I believe they were secure because they knew they were in God's hands. He had had set this whole process in motion, and they trusted that even though the government wasn't to their liking, the government was still under God's hands and under God's control, and if they needed to come here for the census, they needed to come, and if this was the time for the baby to be born, this was God's time, God's place. Uh, they, they were called by God. They were obedient to their country. They trusted that the will of God would never lead them where the grace of God could not keep them. I've always liked that statement that God will take care of us wherever we are. Security does not come from the house or the job or the income or whatever else we put our trust in. It only comes from God. And that's where we ought to be looking for our security. And how well we know here in Bonnie Doon how, how quickly things disappear. Mm -hmm. They're no longer there, no longer available to us. And we understand that. And we have to trust in the midst of that, that God is working. If you will, in that society and in that situation, Joseph was, if you will, homeless, jobless. He had a trade, but 
he didn't necessarily know anybody in Bethlehem to build anything for them. Probably the word got out quickly, but uh, you never know. Uh, and they were there for a couple of years. So he probably sought out some employment and did a few jobs. But they were also, and some people, plenty of people feel this way today, being pushed around by their government, uh, moved in directions that they don't want to be moved in. But the baby was secure, safe, and wrapped in the clothing, laying in the manger, because mom was there. She apparently knew what to do. Uh, moms are supposed to know what to do, although there are plenty of moms that don't seem to know what to do. But they're, they're supposed to know what to do in those situations. <clears throat> More than anything else, they trusted that God would take care of them. Trust in God turns chaos into peace. It doesn't take away the chaos. It just, in our heart, turns it to peace. Let's talk about love, a sense of caring. Mary and Joseph were not alone. They did have each other. They did have God. They were drawn together by by the circumstances in this strange place and being in the, the manger and the stable. But they had their love for each other and they had the child of blessing that came from God. They were not focused on who was missing from their midst. They were focusing on who was present. Uh, a few days ago on Thanksgiving, my son Josh and his wife Summer hosted Dinner for 20 people, and Linda and I got to be there. Of course, that means that three of our other siblings and all of the grandchildren and spouses and that sort of thing were not with us on that Thanksgiving, but 20 people were there. And a lot of them were from his company, people who were displaced from family because of work out here in California. Some of the people, actually, uh, one of the gentleman whose father had been at the party last year had died in between. And uh, so he came uh, without his extended family and knowing that his father had uh, had passed on during the year. Uh, while acknowledging the fact that he his father had died, we grew greater strength from those who were present in that situation. Uh, one, one of the people had been to last year's celebration as well. Uh, she's a manager of a, one of my son's related offices in, uh, uh, in San Jose. And uh, after two years of being with us, might not have even taken that long, but but after two years of being with us, she said, wherever I am next year, I'll find my way back to this group because this has become family to me. And the, the joy of loving others and drawing people into our family, a lot of times, uh, hopefully helps them to feel part of God's family. One of the simple things we can do to turn chaos into peace is to make the most of the relationships we have in our midst, to make those relationships more meaningful. Linda and I, interestingly enough, as best I can tell, out of that group of 20 people, were the only practicing Christians. Okay, it was not a uh, not, not an easy crowd, okay? But my, my son was at least willing to let me say grace over the, the dinner table, and, and I did uh, for the group. And, and uh, I, I was surprised at how many people said amen out loud when I was done praying. So at least they had some tradition, some background. But the conversations of the day turned to faith a lot of times. And the people wanted to know more, not necessarily, you know, I mean, I wish they would say, well, tell me more about Jesus and how I can accept him into my life. That's, that's where I would really like the conversation to begin. That would be so much more fun. 
but the conversation isn't there. It's like, well, how does faith help us in a relationship that, you know, if one person and her boyfriend were there and they'd only been in a relationship for three months and they were about ready to raise the question of what happens if we stay together and I move across the country and you want to stay here in your stable job. And, and we had long conversations about that and opportunities to talk about how faith makes a difference for Linda and I in our 54 years of marriage. And so we talked and people wanted to talk more about faith things than, than normal. And, and it was exciting to see how love bonds the family together and how much better it would be if all of the people in that group knew and loved Jesus the way we do. But time will tell. When the shepherds arrived at the manger, they found, if you will, a new family. They found the king that they were looking for, the one who was bringing peace on earth. But more than anything else, they found Mary and Joseph, and they had the opportunity to share the story with them of what the angels had said and God's vision and God's love for this world. God in his infinite love for us, this is my belief anyway, knows that we are always in the right place at the right time. Even if we don't think we are. And he often lets us know in the midst of that, if we're willing to listen, that we need to let go of our agenda and focus on the people that are around us and love them the way God loves them. Oh. Trusting that these are the people God has in our midst for this moment. It might be that they can help us. It might be that we can help them. But for whatever reason, God knows that we're together at this moment to help turn the chaos of our life and their life into a sense of peace that comes from God. But there's also a sense of future, a sense of hope. Mary and Joseph were aware that this moment in time was the beginning of the future that God had ordained. They'd been told that by the angels. They've been aware of it as they're going along in the process. They heard of the story from Mary, uh, from Elizabeth and from uh, Zechariah, and they knew that they were in the beginning of something great and wonderful that God was doing. Actually, we probably ought to always wake up in the morning and believe that we're at the beginning of something good and great that God is doing. Mary treasured these thoughts in her mind for the future. Advent points us to the coming of the baby. But Advent also points us to a coming that is beyond the baby, if you will, and our celebration of Jesus coming, uh, but to the return of Jesus coming from heaven to bring us to our eternal home. Today, uh, these are all phrases that come out of life from time to time. Today is the sowing of tomorrow's reaping. I don't know if you've ever heard that one. The greatest oak is just a little nut that held its ground. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. No, today is the first day of the rest of our life. Do you see today as an end product of the past? as many people do, or do you see today as the beginning of our future? I happen to be one of those people who looks forward. It's part of my personality, part of my training, part of what I've learned from scripture is that God wants us to see what he has in store for us. Doesn't mind us looking back and seeing what he's done, but let's look forward to what God is at work doing in us, bringing about his will in our lives 
to will and to work for his good pleasure, the scripture tells us, so that we can help others come to know him. And it causes us to ask this question, or at least me to ask this question often. Am I seeking to mold my own future? Or am I expecting him to bring about my best at every turn? That's where I would like to be all the time. That to believe that no matter where I am, no matter what my circumstances are, no matter how I'm looking at it at this particular moment. God is just waiting to do his best for me today, tomorrow, and off into the future at every turn. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know the one who holds tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's the comfort. That's the hope that I have. I remember interviewing an associate pastor years and years ago. Um, my goodness, that could have been 30 some years ago. Um, and I went down to Fuller Seminary to sit and talk with people who were graduating from seminary. And one of the questions I asked them was, well, where do you see yourself in 10 years. And I remember John uh, looked at me after I asked that question. He thought for a long time and he said he, he'd been a teacher for probably five or 10 years before he came to seminary. He said, hmm, 10 years ago, I did not plan to be sitting here. Saturday, we don't know what the weather's going to be like. And yet we keep trying to predict it. We keep trying to think we've got it figured out. When all is said and done. We do not know what tomorrow holds. If we look at back at our lives, I think if we honestly look back, we will find what we thought was to be our future never came. In almost every case. And we also will find that what we thought was going to ruin our life became the building block of who we are today, the doorway to our future. Because we believe that we are held safely in the hands of God. God knows what he's doing. And you are a precious part of his plan, no matter who you are. Chaos, which is around us all the time, has always been around people, probably always will be around people in this world. Chaos can at any moment be turned to peace in our hearts by faith in God by love of others, and by hope that God's goodness will always come to us. Mm -hmm. Be at peace this week. Amen. Amen. Amen.